Good morning and Shabbat Shalom to everyone here and everyone abroad who is watching us through Facebook Live and through YouTube. This morning's Torah portion for this Shabbat is Parasha Vayetze. Vayetze means and went out. And it's speaking of Yaakov going out from his family house in Beersheba, going northward to Haran, where his mother had relatives and during the time that Esau was so enraged with Yaakov stealing the blessing Abraham had instructed Rivka to have him go up and seek a bride during this time until Esau's wrath would be appeased. And so we see this model of Jacob going out from Israel, just as the children of Israel later, his descendants, would go out from the land. And we're going to draw a parallel of Jacob, like Israel, going out from the land, and he is going with the purpose of preparing for marriage. And and the bride right now of Mashiach is preparing for marriage. When Mashiach comes, it's going to be the marriage of the Lamb. And we are currently outside of the land, just like Jacob was outside of the land. And then it was promised to Jacob in Genesis 28 that God would not forget him, just as he promised his descendants when they were outside of the land, God would not forget them and that he would return them back to the land and that this marriage would be culminated and their inheritance would be received. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 28 and we will just read the beginning part which sets the scene for the Hoth Torah, which we will be reading from Hosea 11 verse 7 through Hosea 12 verse 13. And that's where the parallel prophecies come into play. And we see this parallel with Jacob leaving the land, preparing for marriage, and then prophesied that he would return to the land. We're going to see the same thing with the descendants of Israel and us. And there's some very deep and enigmatic prophecies that God gave the prophet Hosea, who was a contemporary of Isaiah in the exact time that the northern kingdom was being besieged by Assyria and the prophecies are given exactly in between the time that Assyria captured Reuben Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh in 740 BC and when they would be coming back in 720 BC and take the rest of the tribes in exile and so this prophecy is very pertinent to right in the midst of this exile of our people. Our parsha begins in Genesis 28, verse 10, and it says, Yaakov Vayetze, that means he went out from Beersheba, and he traveled north towards Haran. This is the exact migration route that the northern kingdom of Israel also followed when they were taken capture by Assyria. They were taken north through Haran to the north side of the Euphrates. And it says he came to a certain place and he stayed the night there because the sun had set. He took a stone from that place and put it under his head and lay down to sleep. And he dreamt there before him that there was a ladder resting on the ground with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of Adonai were going up and down on it. Then suddenly Adonai was standing there next to him, and he said, I am yod heh vav -Heh, the God of Abraham, your grandfather, and the God of Yitzhak. The land on which you are lying this very night, I will give to you and to your descendants. So this is a prophecy, not only that Jacob would return to this land, but that his descendants, following the same exile route, would return to this land. Your descendants, your Zera seed, your offspring, will be as numerous as the grains of dust on the earth. You will expand. Now he's speaking prophetically to the whole nation of Israel, all of the 12 tribes. You will expand to which direction? to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. By you and your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Look, I am with you. I will guard you wherever you go, and I will bring you back into this land. We just sang that in the chorus of Zion this morning. 
I will bring you back home. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised you. So here's this beautiful prophecy that the descendants of Israel, Jacob's name was later changed to Israel, they would migrate to the four corners of the earth. And the prophecy says that when Mashiach comes, God will gather them back from the four corners of the earth in which they were scattered. But there's something for the children of Israel to be doing in between this time of going out of the land, like Vayetze, Jacob went out of the land, and when he returned, what was he doing? He was working, preparing himself for marriage and to receive the bride. And Israel is now in the land of their exile, in the diaspora. But what is our purpose? To be working in sanctification, in holiness, returning to Torah, to be found as a bride without spot or blemish, preparing for the marriage of the Lamb to come when Mashiach comes. So with that thought in mind, let's look at our Hoth Torah in Hosea 11, this parallel between Yaakov going out from the land and preparing for marriage and multiplying, because remember his seed multiplied outside of the land, just like Israel is multiplying outside of the land. The 12 tribes of Israel are dispersed to the four corners of the earth, and they're multiplying, and they're preparing for the marriage that will ensue when Mashiach comes. And then they will be returned to Eretz Israel with blessings in fulfillment of the prophecy. The end of this week's Hoff Torah parallels this perfectly because it mentions in Hosea 12, 11, that Jacob went out from home to the field of Aram. Aram was this area in the north near Haran. And so you see this perfect parallel that draws our minds to something deeper in this lesson. The Hoff Torah begins with the prophet Hosea's rebuke of the people of Israel for forsaking God. Nevertheless, Hosea assures the people that God will not abandon them. How can I give you Ephraim up? How can I deliver you to the hands of the nations? I will not act with my wrath. I will not return and destroy you. The prophet, God through the prophet, promises the whole house of Israel through this term Ephraim, because Ephraim got the firstborn blessing. So whenever you see Ephraim being mentioned, you know he wasn't only the leader that led Israel away from the God of Israel, because they were divided from Judea and they were not worshiping down in Jerusalem. And so they followed a lot of the idol worship of the Canaanites and the surrounding tribes with them. So Ephraim is also a term of the northern kingdom as a whole, but their waywardness, their idolatry, and their adopting other religions. And so he's saying, even though you've done this, I will not forget you. My covenant with you, I will keep. The prophet then discusses the misdeeds of the northern kingdom of Israel and the future degeneration of the kingdom of Judea. He contrasts their behavior to that of their forefather Jacob, who, like Jeff taught last week, was faithful to God. We oftentimes think of Jacob with a negative connotation, but Jacob was faithful to God and prevailed against his enemies, both human enemies and angelic enemies. And we are fighting a war not of flesh and blood, but of principalities and powers to be. We are fighting a war not just with human enemies, but with spiritual hosts. And so we have to um, draw this parallel into our lives as well. He was an overcomer. He overcame with both. The Hoff Torah also makes mention of the ingathering of the exiles. So it's not only about Israel going out and preparing for marriage, but about the ingathering. And it's interesting that we have a feast, a holy day, a Moedim, an appointed time, called the Feast of Ingathering. In Hebrew, it's Sukkot. And it's exactly at this time of year that the ingathering in the future will happen when Messiah gathers the exiles of Israel. It'll be like he's, all of the people that gathered fruit and took it to Jerusalem, the final fall uh, harvest, the gathering of Israel will be very similar to that at that exact same time in the fall in some future year. In Hosea 11.11, 11, 
God likens that ingathering to birds coming from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And we'll dissect this. There's Each verse is worth meditating on and dissecting because especially when you read it in Hebrew, you can read so much depth into it. There's so many multiple messages and different ways that you can read it to give different messages. And I kept reading it over and over and over again and, and getting different things out of it this week in the Hebrew. And we'll just look at a few of these things that came to light. In Parsha Vayetze, it says that Yaakov went out, and the descendants of Israel have also went out. But how shall they return? Hosea 11.7 opens up our Hoff Torah parallel, and he says, And my people waver whether to return to me and to the matter concerning which they call them. Together they do not uphold it. So Israel was allowed to be scattered amongst all the nations, and they were intended to hold on to the oracles of God that God had given our forefathers to preserve Torah. But only one tribe preserved Torah. And who was that? Judah. So the first step to coming back to the land is coming back to God and coming back to his word, coming back to his Torah. And this is why we teach Torah to the house of Israel amongst the nations to return them. Because God says, my people waver. There's people still wavering. Is this really for me? Is this really necessary? Is this really important? I thought it was done away with. All of these excuses and things that they were taught with and paradigms they grew up with. And God is very clearly saying, my people amongst the nations, Israel, they're wavering whether to return to me and to the matter concerning which they call them, which is to be a light to the nations. But we can't be a light to the nations unless we have that light within us. And David said, thy word, O God, is a light, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we must return to the one true God of Israel and to his Torah before we can be returned to the land. We can get that just out of that first verse. Remember, the prophecy was that Jacob's descendants would be scattered to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. They will be regathered back from the four corners of the earth at the coming of Mashiach. But will there be a people that he can find faith with? Even Yeshua said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? There will be very few that are holding fast to the true oracles of God. And this is why they're called a remnant. A remnant means a few leftover, like a bolt of fabric, that last bit of fabric that you really can't make a full garment out of. It's left on the bolt. It's called a remnant. And Israel will have descendants who are holding fast to the oracles of God, but they won't be um, the majority. It will be a few leftovers. Verse 8 says, How shall I give you up, Ephraim? This is Yah speaking through the prophet. How can I ever hand you over, Israel? How shall I make you as Adma and make you as Zeboim? Now, Adma means red earth. When he created Adam, he made him from earth. And the name for that earth was Adam. And it's a red, just like Edom, Esau's name, come, means red also. You hear that same root of the olive and the dalit and the mem. It's in Adma, it's in Adam, it's in Edom. And he's basically saying, I want to make you beautiful again, Israel. I had created you originally beautiful like a bride, and yet you've gone away, and there's cause and effect with that going away. But he wants to recreate us. And he says he would like to make us as Adma or Zeboim. Zeboim is plural for Zebi, meaning beautiful. So he's going to make us new and recreate us in his image and make us a bride without spot or blemish, beautiful once again. And what's amazing is when you f return to the ancient principles, everything in those ancient principles are about returning the blessings back to us, the blessings of health, the blessings of wisdom, the blessings of uh, relationships, the blessings of uh, prosperity and so he wants to have a bride that is adorned beautifully for Mashiach he says I will not carry out my wrath 
Do you know Israel was scattered because they sinned in the land. They adopted the false gods of the Canaanites. And so that northern kingdom led by Ephraim was taken first. And yet God will not carry out the full wrath. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So that's our real wage, isn't it? And yet the wrath of God is something beautiful because He doesn't punish us. I, uh, Romans 1 verse 26 says, The wrath of God is giving us over to the lust of our heart. That means He allows us to experience the cause and effect of where our heart and our focus really is. He's not doing any punishing. He's allowing us to experience the cause and effect of it. And so, yet, if He allowed that to fully go to its final form, it would end in death. And so what it means by him not carrying out wrath is he's not letting it go to its full extent. He's coming in as a savior and he's showing us the way back to his image, which is selfless love, which is the path of eternal life. I will not destroy Ephraim, for I am El. This is the singular of Elohim. And not a man in your midst is the Holy One, and I will not come into another city. So one thing he's saying is don't worship a man, don't worship the form of a man. He's not man, he's spirit. We're to worship him in spirit and truth. And he has placed his name in First Chronicles 6.6, 6, I believe it is. He says, I place my name on Jerusalem. That means that's his city. He's not going to go and set up another city because the first city didn't do things perfectly. He's going to come and restore his people and his city. And this is where Mashiach will reign from as high priest and king. And he will teach the nation's Torah, which just means instructions in how to love God and how to love our fellow men, which will end up restoring the earth. Verse 10 says, They shall follow yod heh vav -Heh, and he shall roar like a lion, for he shall roar, and the descendants shall come trembling from the west. So here God is talking about not allowing the full wrath to take place upon the whole house of Israel, and that he is going to restore Jerusalem, and he will roar from Jerusalem like a lion. And who is he going to do that through? The Lion of Judah, Mashiach, Ben David. And imagery of how he's going to return the children of Israel which are all around the world back to the place where he's placed his name through Mashiach ben David. You see all the imagery in this very simple writing. They shall come trembling as a bird out of Egypt. Imagine the timidness, people knowing that they've done wrong, knowing they worship false gods, knowing that they have rebelled and they've put off the light that they've had. They're coming very humbly, trembling. Now, why would they come like a bird from Egypt and as a dove out of Assyria? Because when our forefathers were first taken captive, these were the two world powers that were vying for power in that day around 735 BC when Hosea is writing this. And our forefathers, even though they continued to migrate and their descendants continued to migrate, many of them died at the beginning of the diaspora, right there in Egypt and right there in Assyria. Area. They went in both different directions. And Judah had made alliances with Egypt, and the northern kingdom had made alliances with Assyria against Judah. And this was how the family was divided. And this was what caused their demise by making a pact or an alliance with these foreign nations. And so imagine our forefathers who have died in these lands with that being the last thing on their mind that they know that they have done wrong and they know the last thing they knew was that they were taken from the land and the next thing they're going to realize is the resurrection. Mashiach is here, and it's what they've always looked forward to. And so imagine people being resurrected from Egypt and Assyria, as well as being taken, those that are alive around the world, and those that have died through, all, through the whole course of the migration. It'll be like they're birds coming back, because they will be hovering in the air. The imagery that this is using is talking about the resurrection. And so they're going to come trembling. Whoa, this is such a mighty scene. Mashiach has come, and he's hovering above the earth. And what does Paul say? 
the Lord shall descend with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. This is on the day of trumpeting. And the dead in Christ shall rise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up with them. And so this is them coming like a bird from the four corners of the earth. Some will be coming from Egypt and some will be coming like doves, humble, from Assyria. And I will make them to dwell in their houses once again, says the Lord. He's going to restore us back to the land of our inheritance in Israel. Amazing imagery of this ingathering happening. Now, Hosea was one of the greatest prophets, and God used him in a unique way in telling him to go and take a prostitute as a bride because he wanted the people of Israel to look up to this great prophet and see an example of what they were doing to God. They were constantly wayward. They were in spiritual adultery. And God knew that this woman would fall back into her harlotry, just like Israel constantly fell back into her harlotry, her spiritual adultery. And so Israel's marriage was an example of what God was experiencing with the whole house of Israel going with and then this woman, he had to go and um, collect her from another man's house and bring her back home, just like God will bring us back home. He had children that God gave prophetic names to called they are not my people. And, but he said, but he who is called not my people will be called beautiful once again. So it's this imagery of even the descendants. You know, the wife is like our forefathers and the children are like the descendants. And so he's given this whole picture of the plan of salvation to the house of Israel through Hosea. And he was a contemporary of Isaiah, and he cried out, yet in vain, against the rapidly deteriorating northern kingdom. They were in rebellion against Judah, which very much they still are today. They were in rebellion to Torah, which very much they are still today. They were in rebellion to going to Jerusalem three times a year, which very much they are today. And you could see him crying out to the people, repent, repent before you go too far and you're exiled from the land. And yet we know they didn't repent. Hosea contrasts God's mercies of the past with Israel's failure to recognize that everything they have is due to God's kindness. Like, why do you think that you have a right to be proud or vain? Or why do you think you own anything? Why are you going wayward? God has blessed you so much. Despite Israel's shortcomings, God says poignantly that he will never desert Israel. The wayward leader of the ten tribes was called Ephraim, and God uses this in prophetic symbolism. Like a spurned but still merciful father or husband, God confesses that he will not make a permanent end of Ephraim because he has pledged that Israel will remain his people and because Israel is innately good and will eventually heed God's call to repent and resume its mission to be a light to the nations, which is what we're seeing since 2009 with this great awakening, Israel recognizing their identity, returning to Torah, returning to a love for brother Judah, a love for the land, and they are teaching the nations in which they're living in. When God will roar like a lion that the end has come, even Ephraim's children will rush to declare their renewed allegiance to him, as we will see in the continued prophecy. Now, beginning with chapter 12, it says, Ephraim has surrounded me with lies. He's still wanting us to understand our waywardness. The house of Israel was full of deceit. And there's still so much wrong mixture of paganism that the house of Israel has incorporated in with the worship of the one true God of Israel. And this has crept in through pagan Rome, which never really changed. It just changed the form or the guise. Pagan Rome around 300 AD became papal Rome. And this little horn would think to change times and laws and it forbid the worship of God and the mention of his name, the worship of Torah, the keeping of Shabbat, all of these things happened around the same time. And this is the Christianity that people know today, even though they call themselves Protestants, which means protesting 
against the Roman Catholic Church, they are still following blindly the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church unknowingly such as the day of the sun because pagan Rome worshipped the sun god which was passed down all the way from the time of Assyria through Babylon through Persia through Greece to pagan Rome and into the papal system that began the dark ages of ignorance of God's people. And so we see this prophetic imagery of the whole house of Israel with wayward Ephraim saying that he's surrounding God with lies. He's still claiming to worship God, but he's not speaking the truth. The house of Israel is full of deceit, but Judah still rules with God. This word in the Hebrew has a connotation of authority that God has given Judah. He is still maintaining it. And with that authority, we, and since he's the only one that's preserved Torah, we have to go back to brother Judah humbly, just like it says Ephraim will return like a dove. We need to come with humble hearts realizing that we have gone wayward and we have lost the oracles of God through the ages. And there's a people that while they might not be perfect, they have preserved those oracles and the Torah and we should be willing to learn from brother Judah it says that Judah still rules with God and with the Holy One he is faithful now this is an amazing contrast from the northern ten tribes who have gone wayward who have traveled north and west throughout Europe in the medieval ages and then on to America in the last 250 years and are still residing all over the world and so you see this prophecy is past and present with the descendants of Israel. They've inherited lies. And Jeremiah 16, 19 says, To you, meaning to those in the nations of Israel, you will come from the ends of the earth, and you will say in that day, Our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things in which there is no profit. That means the house of Israel will wake up. They will realize error and return to truth. Assimilated into Christianity, Ephraim has misrepresented the word of God and has adopted pagan practices of worship and forms of idolatry. While Judah, who is seeking to preserve the word, is still ruling with God and preserving Torah, and here he's called faithful to that cause. Verse 2 says, Ephraim grazes on, the Hebrew word is ruach, means spirit. But it has a connotation of wind also, because ruach also means wind, and chases the east wind. So if the wind comes from the east and it's blowing towards the west, Ephraim, the northern ten tribes, have basically just been following after feeling. It's kind of like something you can't grasp, and you're going westward, and you don't know what you're going westward for, and you're grasping at the wind, but it doesn't profit you anything. This is the prophetic analogy um, and... and um, allegory that God is using through the prophet. You can kind of see the whole northern ten tribe kingdom just following like the wind westward, northern and westward. He says, all day he increases in deceit and plunder. They even make a treaty with Assyria and oil brought to Egypt. And once again, this is a dual prophecy of past and present because, you know, just recently under Obama's reign, uh, you could see funding for the Islamic Brotherhood from the U.S. And so in a way, U.S. is represented as Ephraim and they're funding, they're sending oil to Egypt. And this is funding our enemies, the p enemies of God's people. Same thing with Assyria. Why are we making alliances and pacts with the enemy of our brother Judah, who is currently in the land of Israel? But it was happening back then as well. After Assyria captured the northern um, tribes that were east of the Jordan River, which was Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. They captured them 20 years earlier before they captured uh, the rest of the northern kingdom in 720. So Hosea is speaking right in this time frame, and we call this time frame where this war was happening the Syro-Ephraimite um, War. This is something that's not taught in history anymore, but basically it comes from the words Syrian and Ephraimite, meaning the northern ten tribes. They were making a pact together until they thought 
thought their friend was coming to help them against Judah, and they ended up taking him captive, and they took him north of the Euphrates River. So this took place when Assyria had become a regional superpower, and the tributary nations of Syria, which is called Aram in prophecy, and that's what it likens Jacob to going to Aram, and the northern kingdom of Israel, prophetically called Ephraim, decided to form an alliance to break away. They attacked the northern kingdom of Judah, ruled by King Ahaz at this time when he refused to join this coalition. So basically the Ephraimites, northern ten tribes are saying, come on Judah, we got to resist Egypt by aligning ourselves with Assyria. You should join us in this coalition. And Judah says, no, I'm not going to join you in that. So then those northern brothers attacked brother Judah with the help of Assyria in that day. And this is what the time frame is that all of this um, prophecy is being given to the northern kingdom. Since that time, the migration of Israel has followed the east wind westward to America and has made alliances with the enemies of the Jews and sent things to those enemies, just as the prophecy said. Verse 3 says, But there is contention toward yod heh -Heh by Judah to visit upon Jacob according to his ways, according to his deeds, he shall recompense him. This means... Judah still has an issue with the northern kingdom. And we see that today. They don't trust the northern kingdom. They don't trust their descendants, which have assimilated into Christianity. And it says, In the womb he seized his brother's heel, speaking of Jacob. And with his strength he strove, and in our English Bibles it says, with angels. But do you know, in the Hebrew it says, Aleph Tav, Elohim. Now this is the same word that's used to, uh, that's translated into God. Elohim, and yet it's a plural word. In the beginning, Elohim made the heavens and the earth, the scriptures say in Hebrew. So it's interesting, he's striving against God. He's not just striving against an angel. In English, he gets translated as the angel of the Lord, angel of yod heh vav that he's wrestling against. In what way is the descendants of Jacob, of Israel, still striving with God? But then here in verse 5, it changes the word. It says, he strove with an angel. It gets translated again, but the Hebrew word is different this time. It's el malak. Malak can be a messenger of any type. It doesn't mean just an angelic being. It could be a prophet. It could be a priest. It could be a messenger, meaning an angel. So think of this, how the children of Israel have had contention and strove against not only Elohim, but against a messenger, a prophet. Because God had a purpose for his prophet to be sent. In Deuteronomy 18, he says, I will send a prophet like unto Moshe. He'll be humble and meek, and I'll put my words in his mouth, and you are to listen to him. But we have put a different image in the place of Yehoshua. Did you realize that? We have put a, a never the name. Instead of Yehoshua, we have put Isus. And we say Isus does away with God's law. And he puts himself in the place of God. And so it's no wonder by this misrepresentation of the Son of God that Judah will never receive the truth as long as it's being misrepresented. And so you see God using this hidden allegory of these different Hebrew words of you're having contention with God when you're misrepresenting his son, the Moloch. And it says, he strove with an angel and prevailed. He wept and beseeched him. In Bethel, now this is one of those places where it goes from being both past and present and future. Bethel means house of God. And this is where Jacob um, wrestled with this angel. But imagine it prophetically. In the house of Elohim, he shall find him. Who shall find him? The whole house of Israel will end up finding the true messenger of God in the future, in his rightful place. The misrepresentation will end. Both Judah and Christians will see him as he really is. 
the living Torah, teaching Torah from Jerusalem in the house of God, in the rebuilt temple. And there he shall speak with us. This is amazing enigmatic prophecy of Mashiach in the last days. In the past, all of Jacob's descendants have wrestled with this Malach in different ways. Is he valid? Is he real? One group says. The other one says he's not only valid and real, but, and they put him in a wrongful place in the place of God and doing away with God's law. And so there's a place for both camps, both Judah and the Northern Kingdom, to come to, to have the veil lifted from their eyes and to see the messenger of God, the prophet and priest, everything that a Moloch represents, a messenger of God in his rightful place. This completely blew me away this week as I was reading it in the Hebrew, seeing these deep prophetic um, allusions, uh, past, present, and future. And then right after that it says, and yod heh vav -Hey is the Elohi of host. So it's showing who the true, one true God of Israel is, yod heh vav -Hey. It says yod heh vav -Hey is his remembrance. That means it's a name to remember. It's a name to keep you connected with the source. And you, by your God, shall return. Now it comes around full circle, because remember he says you're wavering whether you will return, but you need to return to the one true God of Israel. Now it's clarifying that we will return by yod heh vav -Hey. Keep loving kindness and justice and hope to your God always. This is his characteristics, and this is the characteristics of his people. The following two verses, 8 and 9, is a description of Ephraim's descendants without Torah. So the way Hebrew thinking um, is, and the way that Hebrew prophecy is often written, and you'll see it in Revelation too, this is what unlocks John's visions, is they always are given in a cycle, and they come back around to square one, the same topic, and they do it again, another cycle, and you'll mention the same thing. That's why you have different depictions of the coming of Mashiach in Revelation, and then the time of tribulation, and then um, the resurrection, and you know you see this in a cycle over and over and over. Same thing here, he's going back now to Ephraim's way, waywardness, even though he had completed it with that you shall return. Now it's starting this understanding again in case we missed it the first time. He says, a trafficker, this is speaking of Ephraim, who has deceitful scales in his hand. This means he's not quite telling you the truth. He loves to oppress. And why have the world man-made religions suppressed the truth? to rule over the people and to oppress the people and to maintain control over the people. So this is why truth is so freeing. The more we can sh shine out truth to the nations, it will set them free from the control of men. And Ephraim said, surely I have become rich. And he has. He has ruled the last two great world empires, the British Empire and America. Surely I have become rich. I have found power for myself. All my toils shall not suffice for my iniquity, which is sin. And of course, 1 John 3, 10, uh, 3 verse 4 confirms this, says sin is the transgression of the Torah. And that gets translated as law in Old English. But this is what Ephraim is saying also. Sin is the transgression of Torah, and he's been in transgression of the Torah since 2,740 years ago when he began to break away from Jerusalem and from Brother Judah. Verse 10 says, I am yod heh vav -Hey, your Elohi, from the land of Egypt. He's reminding us he's the same one that delivered our forefathers. I will yet make you dwell in tents. He's saying, just like that cycle I was talking about, our forefathers dwelled in tents when he delivered us from Egypt through the wilderness experience. Well, there's another great exodus to come, and there's another wilderness experience, and there's another time where God's going to humble his people and teach us through this wilderness experience. Yet I will make you dwell in tents as in the days of the early times. And during this time of the Messianic age, we will live in temporary humble dwellings as well. 
I have spoken to the prophets, God says. I have multiplied visions. And this word multiplied has a connotation of layering upon layering. Just like we're deciphering meanings, past, present, and future, he has m used certain Hebrew words to multiply the visions. The word for vision is chazon, same thing that we see with the book of Daniel. And by the hand of the prophets, I have conveyed allegory. See, he wants us to search deeper and deeper into these messages from his prophets because they weren't only for the house of Israel back then. They're just as much, if not more, for the descendants of Israel today, right as we're beginning to return to understand how we've gone wayward and how we need to return. Multi-layered prophetic allusions to Israel's descendants, past, present, and future. And then verse 12 says, if there is destruction in Gilead, it is because they were but vanity. So if you've experienced destruction, and Gilead is where he wrestled with this angel. And so he's using both the story of Jacob with our forefathers and with us today. He's basically saying, if you have experienced bad things in your life, it's because you've gone wayward. In Gilgal, they sacrificed oxen. Also, their altars were like heaps on the furrows of the field. And now the big climax to this Haftorah. And Jacob fled to the field of Aram, and Israel worked for a wife. It's telling us we are outside of the land, just like Jacob was outside of the land. And it's time for us to prepare for the, the marriage. And for a wife, he guarded. And now there's this hidden entrance allusion to Mashiach. Because not only are we looking at Jacob and the descendants of Jacob, but we're looking who came through the descendants of Jacob, through Judah. Yehoshua. And what did he say? I come not but for the lost house of Israel, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so here, Hosea, 700 years before, Yeshua even mentioned that, says that just like Israel worked for a wife and he guarded the sheep, Mashiach is looking for a wife, pure and spotless, and he's guarding the sheep. This was his purpose in his first coming. That's what we call Mashiach ben Yosef. It's um, a humble fulfillment of the prophet like unto Moshe and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. But Mashiach ben David will be the one to set up the kingdom of God and to build the temple and to reign as a prophet and a priest and a king in that day, the Messianic age. And now it says, and through a prophet, the Lord brought up Israel from Egypt. What is he trying to draw our minds to? Our forefathers were led by a great prophet through that time. The descendants of Israel will be led by a great prophet through that time. A prophet who loves the sheep of the house of Israel, who's looking for a wife. Who do you think that could be? Do you see how it's continually adding to, just in case you thought, well, there might be a correlation here. It gives you a double witness and then a triple witness. And through a prophet, the Lord brought up Israel from Egypt. And do you know in the Messianic age, when Messiah comes, all those who have died through the ages in their exile in Egypt and in Assyria and in all the lands of their dispersion will be brought back to the land. And through a prophet, they were guarded. This is the prophet like unto Moshe, prophesied in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 through 19. Yehoshua, who 2,000 years ago was recognized as Mashiach ben Yosef, who very soon Jews and Christians alike and the whole world will recognize as Mashiach bin David. This is the one who came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And this is the good news that God did not forget his covenant that he made with our forefathers. And that even though we've gone wayward, like is symbolized with Ephraim, no one is perfect. Judah's gone wayward in a sense too, but they had a purpose as well. Judah preserved the Torah and the commandments. And the northern kingdom preserved the knowledge of the Son of God, Yehoshua, who came for the sheep of the lost house of Israel. And yet, they've kept these two things separately until now. 
as the punishment has been lifted off the whole house of Israel, we see a merger of a people who are keeping the commandments of God and have their testimony in Yehoshua. And this is the good news, because John saw this in vision. He said, here is the patience of the saints, the perseverance of the saints in that day. They keep the commandments of God and have their testimony in Yehoshua. And God hid, even through the prophet Hosea, that this would be the very prophet who would come and lead us back to Israel, even like Moshe was a prophet who led the children of Israel in the days of old. And so this is beautiful parallel, past, present, and future that we can glean deeper understanding, knowing not only our identity in Israel, but our purpose and our divine destiny. With that, let's stand and we will close in prayer. Abba Father, we just are amazed at what you're revealing through your word and we thank you for your love and for your son, Yehoshua, the prophet like unto Moshe who came for the sheep of the house of Israel. We were lost sheep. We were scattered all over the world. And we forgot our identity. And we forgot our purpose, which was to be a light to the nations. But you have restored that through Yehoshua. And so, Father, help us be your holy people, your Kodashim, who keep the commandments of God and live it out in acts of loving kindness to our fellow man and preserve the testimony of Yeshua in his humble, loving walk that he was even willing to lay down his life for his fellow man. And this is our example. We must die to the flesh and we must be willing to lay down our life for one another in the body of Mashiach. So thank you, Father. We ask for your spirit to help continue to take the scales from our eyes, to give us deeper understandings, and to not worry about where we were at or where our forefathers were at in the past, but to just keep our eyes on you. For by beholding, we will become changed into that same likeness and be restored back to you as a bride without spot or blemish. This is our prayer. In your holy name we pray. Amen.